you'll be pleased to hear that I've got some new headshots done, like literally a couple of days ago. So <laughs> old, old headshots are good. <laughs> In case anybody wants their money back, like seeing some <laughs> old guy presenting. I admit that is a fairly old picture. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming out and talking, uh, listening to me talk rather. Um, so I'm Chris. I work at Microsoft uh, on something called the Power BI Customer Advisory Team. We're part of the Power BI product group uh, and there are two parts to our job. One part is that we go out and talk to customers, people like you, large enterprise customers and help them be successful with Power BI. Second half is we take what we learn and go back to the, our colleagues in the product group and uh, help that help use that information to make Power BI better. So I spent a lot of time talking to customers and for better or worse, I seem to have got myself into a position where I'm one of the people that people talk to about direct query mode. Is anybody using direct query mode? Ooh, good number. Is anybody using direct query mode and successful? <laughs> It seems yeah, like more people put their hands up just then. So you can certainly be successful with direct query mode. Um, in my job, I only ever see the disasters. So maybe I'm a bit, a little bit biased, but you can certainly be successful with power with direct query mode in Power BI. But what we're going to do tonight is talk a little bit about what direct query is, when you're going to use it, when you shouldn't use it because part of the problem is a lot of people use it when they probably shouldn't. And then we will talk about the best practices for it. Um, this is definitely a work in progress. Every week I learn something new. Um, generally, when I learn something new, I'd like to blog about it. But there are a lot of unknown unknowns to do with direct query mode. So this is the current state of my knowledge, talking about data modeling, talking about data set properties, report design, general tuning and things. So let's start off with the basics. What is direct query mode? There are two fundamental ways of working with data in Power BI. There is import mode, where you copy the data from your source into your data set. And then when your report runs, Power BI gets the data that it needs for that report render from the data set. Get stored in Power BI's own in-memory column store database engine. In direct query mode, there is still a data set, but the data set doesn't store any data. So at a very, very high level, when direct query mode, your report runs, still generates DAX queries against the data set, but then the data set takes those DAX queries, translates them into a query language that your data source understands. Your data source then returns the data and brings it back to the data set. The data set glues the results of those queries all back together and puts it back for the report. So the report shows the data you need. Now, you will notice that I very carefully not said SQL queries. Probably 99% of the time when you're in direct query mode, your data source is a relational database that speaks SQL, which means that the data set is generating SQL queries in the background, but that is not always the case. If you're using, for example, Azure Data Explorer, which by the way is a great bit of technology and you should absolutely check out, uh, Azure Data Explorer speaks SQL, but Power BI, when it works in direct query mode on Azure Data Explorer, generates a query language called KQL. And there will be other cases as well where direct query mode generates a query language other than SQL. But that's the basics of it. Report runs, DAX queries go to the data set, data set generates queries against the source, source returns the data, data set turns the data back to the report. Of course, direct query mode only works with data sources that A, have a query language, which means you can't do direct query mode on a CSV file, and B, have a query language that a Power BI connector can actually generate. In a little bit more detail, this process, uh, if you think about a single visual on one of your Power BI reports, that single visual generates a single DAX query, usually. That DAX query can actually return multiple result sets. 
So if you look at the DAX query, there will be an evaluate statement for every result set returned by the query. Sometimes you have more than one evaluate statement. And each evaluate statement returns a table of data. That evaluate statement gets translated back, and let's say SQL for the rest of the presentation, just to make things easier, it gets generated, it gets turned back to SQL. But a single DAX evaluate statement could get turned into more than one SQL query. We'll see some examples of that in a moment. So one visual could ask for multiple DAX result sets, and each DAX result set could uh, return result in multiple SQL queries. So one visual could actually be generating lots and lots and lots of SQL queries against your data source. And this is where things can start to cause some problems. Now, let's talk about when it's appropriate to use direct query mode. Generally, we say there are three scenarios where you should consider using direct query mode. Actually, before I say this, the most important thing is that import mode should always be your default. And if you don't know which one to use, use import mode. <laughs> now, the three scenarios where you would consider using direct query mode. When you need to see real-time data in your report. When the data in your database changes all the time, and you need your report to reflect those changes. You know, maybe you're looking at you know, a list of train cancellations at the station, and those, those trains could be canceled all the time. You want to build a little report that shows the train cancellations. So first scenario for direct query mode, real-time data. Second scenario, when you've got really, really, really large amounts of data that either you cannot fit into import mode, or you don't have the time to load into import mode. Import mode, like I said, is an in-the-memory database engine. And because it's in memory, and because in the Power BI service, we don't have infinite memory that we can allow you to use, then there are limits on how much data you can load in import mode. What's the maximum amount of data you can load in import mode? Of course, it depends. but realistically you can work with a couple of billion rows of data in import mode if you really 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 know what you're doing of course even if you can fit all of your data into memory loading that data in can take time and of course you can use incremental refresh to load bits of data rather than all the data but again that could take time so maybe you know you don't need real-time data maybe the data needs to change every hour but maybe you can't load the changes that have happened in the last hour in the amount of time you've got available so maybe then direct query mode would be appropriate and then the third and final scenario where you consider using direct query mode is for regulatory reasons. If you work in a highly regulated industry, it's likely that you have to get sign off for putting your data anywhere. And maybe you haven't got sign off for loading your data into the Power BI service, even though as a Microsoft person, I would say we have all the certifications you would ever want. And tons and tons of people have the most sensitive data in the world stored in Power BI. So it's probably going to be OK, but maybe those boring security and compliance people are causing a problem, in which case you know, maybe direct query mode is your only option. But like I said, import mode should always, always, always be your default. The reason is import mode is much, much easier to tune. Direct query mode, as we will see, gets complicated, partly because it has more moving parts and partly because with direct query mode, you've got the Power BI bit to tune and the data source bit to tune. And that's usually two separate people, whereas import mode, you just need somebody who knows what they're doing with Power BI. Bad reasons to use direct query mode. Now, I have these conversations with customers all the time. Let's go back to real time data. Now, I think as BI reporting professionals, we've all had this conversation. Somebody comes to you and says, I want this report, but it's got to be real time. Why? The data in the source only changes once a day. Why do you want real time data? Well, it's got to be real time. We've got to have real time. Real time data sounds way more impressive. No, don't just 
assume that people who've asked for real-time data that they need real-time data. In a lot of cases, when people have been given real-time data, the next thing is, well, I was looking at this report, and then the number just changed. Which one's right? Well, you asked for real-time data. It's changing all the time. People get confused by real-time data. Sometimes some latency actually makes it easier for you to make decisions. So don't just assume that you know, real-time data is good. Secondly, is anybody using a people who are using direct query mode? Is anybody using Synapse or BigQuery or Snowflake or one of those things? Databricks maybe in direct query mode. There are always pushy salespeople associated with these sources, even at Microsoft. And guess what? These salespeople are paid on how much of their stuff you buy and use. You know, they're paid, the more queries you run, the more money they get. And guess what? Direct query mode generates lots and lots and lots of queries. And they're going to say, well, you know, our source should be the single source of the truth. So you should put all of your BI queries against it and buy more credits. Um, that's a bad reason to use direct query mode. Um, I will let you into a secret, and you know I, I'm going to include Microsoft on this because you know, the same thing happens with Synapse. We generally find that import mode is not only faster, it is cheaper as well. If you grab your data once a day, maybe you use incremental refresh to just get the data that's changed, load it into Power BI. You might have to pay for Power BI Premium to you know, work with the data volumes you want, but you will probably end up paying less using import mode, even if you're buying premium, than if you're using direct query mode and running, running lots of queries and paying for the privilege of doing it. I was on a call at 7.30 this morning, I kid you not, with somebody who is using direct query mode. And I said, well, you know, maybe you should import the data. And do you know what he said? He said, what's the point of my data warehouse then? Why well, not? What's the point of it? Anyway. A lot of people who've been sold these expensive cloud data warehouse systems often think as well, this is going to be the fastest thing on earth. And, you know, it is for a lot of things, but I'd say the Vertipac in-memory column store engine that Power BI uses is just as fast, if not faster. And it's also faster from a Power BI point of view, because, you know, if you're just writing whatever SQL query you want, yeah, you can write a tuned query. Power BI in any BI front end, always has to generate SQL, and it's not always the most optimal SQL. You don't have control or much control over the SQL that gets generated. And also, a lot of these cloud data warehouse systems have issues with concurrency, with a large number of concurrent users or queries. The Vertipac engine is very highly optimized for that. It's also highly optimized for all those complex DAX calculations you like to write, which might be difficult or impossible to translate back to SQL. So, you know, I still think the VersPack engine is generally faster. Another reason you might be <laughs> allergic to the idea of duplicating data. You know, people say, I'm just not going to move my data. Why? Well, I just don't want to move my data. Um, that's a noble thing to say, but sometimes you've got to move your data to get the best performance. So there we are. And then probably the last bad reason, and actually I've got a, I've got a lot of sympathy for this. Um, duplicating your data, the reason people give that they don't want to duplicate their data is that they want to enforce security in one place. Uh, you know, it would be lovely if you could enforce security in one place and have every single tool that went on top of it, you know, to reflect that security. I don't think that's necessarily feasible at the moment. Lots of vendors are working towards it. Who knows what might happen in the future? But, you know, at the same time, why can't that one place where you enforce your security for your BI be Power BI rather than the relational database? Just saying. All right. So let's assume that you're using Power BI for the right reasons. Now let's start thinking about the best practices, the uh, good things that you need to do to make direct query work well. Like I said, you can make direct query work well, but in import mode, you can do all kinds of bad things and it all just works. With direct query mode, it is much, much easier to make a mistake and then everything fails horribly. So number one thing you have to think about is your data modeling. 
and your data has to be modeled properly before it gets to Power BI. Now, in Power BI, you've got the Power Query Editor for transforming your data. Maybe your data isn't quite the format you want it. Maybe you want to do some filtering or some unpivoting or adding some extra columns. You can do that in the Power Query Editor. You can do that with calculated columns in DAX and things. Don't do those things in direct query mode. Everything has to be a perfect star schema with all the columns you want, everything already done before the data gets to Power BI. Because, for example, you, know, you can do stuff in the Power Query Editor in direct query mode, but guess what? Those transformations you define there will also get converted back to SQL, which will make your SQL more and more complicated, which will then potentially cause performance problems. You know, you want everything to be as simple as possible when Power BI comes to generating SQL. So no transformations in the Power Query Editor, no calculated columns, none of that. Um, it's also worth thinking about making sure you set any nullable columns to be nullable, any not nullable columns to be not nullable. You need to, again, not have views on views on views on views. You need to uh, avoid nested data structures. You know, some cloud data warehouses are bad at joins, and then they say, well, instead of having multiple fact tables, you just have one fact table and then that's nested structures. You know, BigQuery is a little bit like that. You can't handle nested structures, at least at the moment, with Power BI. You need a nice star schema, as simple as possible. Probably the last thing to mention on modeling, and this is a, a big one, a lot of people in the BI world don't like the idea of star schemas. They think, well, why don't we just have everything in one big flat wide table? That's what our old BI tool did. Why don't we just have that for Power BI? Just avoid all the joins. That is a bad idea still in direct query mode. There are some advantages in avoiding joins, but there are also some disadvantages. For example, if you've got everything in one big flat wide table and that includes all your dimensions and you know Power BI needs to populate a slicer with all of the distinct values from a dimension in, instead of going to a dimension table and getting just the distinct values, now you're getting going to a table with as many rows as your fact table and trying to get the distinct values out. That can be not a good thing. So star schema, star schema, star schemas all the way. Um, actually, one other last thing to mention. If you're working in direct query mode, be very, very careful about using SQL queries as the source of your tables in the data set. There are some scenarios where it's a good idea, and we'll talk about one with dynamic M parameters in a moment, but it doesn't necessarily hurt performance. Um, in some cases, it can be good for performance, but it can make maintenance a real nightmare. So be very careful about that. So model, model, model your data correctly. Then, you need to set some properties. But let's actually have a look at a direct query mode data set before we start to talk about the model properties. So here, if I look at my one of my demo data sets, I've got the AdventureWorks DW SQL Server um, database running locally on my PC because Wi-Fi is not always reliable. Um, and here I've got a very, very simple direct query mode data set, a nice star schema. I have a fact table called internet sales. It's got about 60,000 rows in. I have a product dimension table with product name and color columns in. And I've got a date dimension table with years, months, and dates in. So really, really standard, simple fact table. So. Model it nicely, nice star schema. Let's start thinking about some of the properties that you probably want to set that are, specific, that are particularly important for direct query mode. And these are ones that people often forget. Now, I talked about modeling your data properly. Data quality is good. So that means that you should have referential integrity. If I double click on a relationship, if I can assume referential integrity. So all of the dimension key columns from my fact table link up to 
key columns in my dimension tables for this relationship, I can click this box and assume referential integrity. This is important because it means in the background, Power BI can now generate inner joins instead of left outer joins when it joins the dimension table to the fact table. And in most cases on most platforms, that is more efficient and results in faster queries. So there's that. Yep. It will generate some queries to check that, um, but you can ignore the checking as well and just go ahead and do it. I think. Uh, this PowerPoint crashed on me. Never mind, let's kill PowerPoint and come back. So other properties that are really important. If we go to options and settings options, the other really, really, really important property is on the options dialog go to current file direct query and maximum connections per data source so in direct query mode we're running sql queries against the source which means that power bi has to open and manage connections from the power bi service back to your data source how many connections is it allowed in its pool this is the property that tells you so this is on a per data set basis. The default is 10. That is also the maximum if you're using shared capacity, Power BI Pro. If you're using premium, you can increase this up to 30. And I can let you in on a secret. We are going to increase that a little bit more for premium at some point in the future. Because most of the time having more connections open means Power BI can run more concurrent queries against your data source, which means that everything is faster, except when Power BI runs too many concurrent queries against your data source and your data source can't handle it, and then everything gets slower. So you probably do need to check what the optimal size for this is. And remember, test not only for a single user, but you should be doing some load testing as well, definitely with direct query mode. I wrote a blog post about that this weekend. Other properties? For the question yeah. On that box, so um, in the model, two columns. Mm -hmm. Level of impact, I have, I have any different? No, not really at all. I mean, I personally always. Oh, sorry. Absolutely, yes. So the question was, some of those columns have got default aggregations on them. Um, personally, so you're talking about like the the kind of default aggregation for a column to say it should be someone, I just. Yeah, so if you were to put cancel on there, you've got two columns in the center table. Yep. Sales like amount. sales amount. So generally as a rule, you'd use a measure instead of I mean, yes, explicitly. yes. So, so what I'm wondering is what, whether that has an effect if you had a much larger model. Um, so the question is, does setting the default aggregation have an effect or rather than you using kind of actual measures? Um, yes and no. Uh, no, in that it doesn't have an effect on the actual measures, um, because if you just drag a column in and say to sum, it's basically the same DAX as if you've written a sum measure. Um, but this, you've set me up very nicely for one of the things that I was going to show you. Uh, I should have opened tabular register before I do this. But um, something interesting to point out is that there is actually a property on the data set called um, discourage implicit measures, which is meant for use uh, internally. Um, but you can set it here in tabular editor. If I click connect in the Power BI service to a data set here, you can actually set this property. It gets set automatically when you have a calculation group inside your data set. But if you set this, this will actually stop any implicit measures ever being created. Now, like I said, that doesn't affect the DAX for the measures, but it turns out the filter pane, if you've ever wondered what those numbers are in the filter pane next to each item, they are counts for the number of values for each item in the filter pane. And guess what? 
if you open the filter to pane and those counts get populated, that's another potentially very large SQL query, which you probably don't want to run. So turning off discourage implicit measures actually is probably a good thing. Uh, let me show you that here. If I go to the model here in tabular editor, the hopefully you can see this, but there is a discourage implicit measures property here. Um, while we're here, there is another um, property that you can go and play with. Um, I would love to have demoed it tonight, but we've temporarily turned it off because we found out there's a problem with it. Um, but there is a max parallelism per query property here. Up until now, and still by default, when a single DAX query generates SQL queries, those SQL queries all get run one after the other in sequence. Now, sometimes they have to be because there are dependencies between SQL queries, but that's not always the case. And when this property is finally working properly and doesn't cause any nasty other things, um, this will allow you to control in Power BI Premium, assuming you're using Premium, the number of parallel queries that can be run for a single DAX query. Now, if you've got multiple visuals on the page, then those DAX queries can all generate SQL queries, which will get run in parallel anyway. This is specifically for the SQL queries that are generated by the same DAX query. But we have seen some really, really, really big benefits from setting this. And setting this might well be you know, one reason why you decide to go and use Power BI Premium for your direct query data set. I do have a blog post about this. Um, from earlier this year. And you know, if you look at this is a, a DAX query that generates uh what six five SQL queries, uh no six SQL queries. This is what you see with the um property set to its default. Uh each of those six SQL queries is a kind of highlighted blue bar in DAX Studio, and you can see they're all being run in sequ sequence. Uh here they are run all in parallel using uh, that max parallelism per query. So this is really, really important. And when we turn it back on, um, please go away and test it because this is one of the, this along with the max number of connections property is one of the biggest, most important things that you can do to get good performance in direct query mode. Um, there is also another property that um, is turned on by default in the Power BI service but is uh, needs to be turned on explicitly in Power BI Desktop. It's a preview feature called Horizontal Fusion. Um, this simply allows Power BI to, instead of generating multiple SQL queries, where possible, compress those into a single SQL query to get more data in a single SQL query. And again, we found this makes some big changes to big improvements to performance. But this is on by default in the Power BI service and it has been for several months now. So I don't know why it's not on in desktop by default. Uh, apart from all that, there are some very specific properties and changes for individual connectors. Um, before we go into that, it's worth mentioning that there are actually two different types of Power BI connector for different data sources. There are the older cartridge based connectors. So if anybody's old enough to remember Power Pivot or Analysis Services Tabular, these cartridge based connectors were the ones that were built for that platform. They are things like the SQL Server Connector, Oracle, Teradata, some of the kind of older sources. Um, those connectors, basically the analysis services engine inside Power BI just generates the SQL that it needs directly. Uh, for newer sources, we have something called um, M-based connectors, which use the Power Query engine, which allow you to do direct query mode on much, much, a much wider range of data sources, including Snowflake, BigQuery, and so on. Um, the M-based connectors in particular tend to have extra properties that it's worth knowing about. Um, and these will be documented either on the on the documentation for the connector or unfortunately spread around various different blog posts and things. But this is especially true for the Snowflake connector. Um, earlier this year, hopefully this is going to work again if I do this. Earlier this year, I collaborated with um, 
people at Snowflake. Yes, I work at Microsoft and talk to Snowflake uh, about best practices for using direct query mode with Snowflake. I'm working on something similar with Databricks at the moment, which will be published in a month or two. And, you know, for example, for Azure Data Explorer, um, the person who actually builds the connector for Azure Data Explorer has got a blog and um, there are lots of interesting properties there. <laughs> so, by all means, go and have a quick bingle for your uh, connector and see what the best practices are. Things are fairly sparse, but can make a big, big difference to performance. All right. So we have modeled everything nicely. The next thing is, well, how do I know that I'm getting the performance I want? How do I know everything's working well? Probably the most important thing you need to do is to be able to see the SQL queries that are generated. Now, the easy way to see the SQL queries that are generated is to go back to your data source and look at them there. But you know, we all know that's not always easy. You don't always have permissions to do that. So you probably want to be able to look at the SQL queries that are generated by Power BI, for example, in Power BI Desktop or in the Power BI service. Um, there are a number of different ways of doing this, but confusingly, some of them work for some sources and some of them work for others. Again, this is down to the two different flavors of connector that we've got. First of all, we've got Performance Analyzer. So let's go to this data set. This is, remember, connected to SQL Server on my own PC. And if we look at this, this is just a report with a simple table in. And if I go to Optimize, Performance Analyzer, Start Recording, I can now, instead of just clicking this Refresh Visuals, there is a little icon up here in the top right-hand corner so I can refresh an individual visual. So let's just refresh this individual visual. There's the table for it. I can expand that, copy query. And because this is connected to SQL Server, when I paste the query in here, I see the DAX query, and then I see all the T-SQL queries that are generated by that DAX query. So that works really nicely. And in this case, we've just got a single SQL query here. Now, this isn't always going to work. I have a direct query mode data set here connected up to Snowflake. Unfortunately, if I start Performance Analyzer and refresh this, oh, look how snow, slow Snowflake is. I'm kidding. It, it's, it's, a, you know, I respect my competitors, but if we copy the query here and paste it in here, you only see the DAX query because this is an M-based connector and so on. Um, the only reliable way of getting the uh, actual SQL generated, and in some cases with M-based connectors, Power BI generates T-SQL, which gets converted to M, which gets converted to the query language of choice, I know um, what you need to do, and this does not work for um, other cartridge based connectors, is go to the Power Query Editor window, uh, go to Tools, go to Start Diagnostics, go to your report, refresh the visual, wait for it to come back. Go back to the Power Query and uh, stop diagnostics. And then you can see three diagnostics queries have appeared up here. We want to go to the detailed one. We want to go to the uh, data source query column. And here we scroll right down to the bottom. This is where we can see the actual SQL generated against Snowflake. Other things we can do, we can use Profiler to run a Profiler trace. Um, let's just close this and not save the changes. But if I go to here and go to External Tools and 
I've got SQL Server Profiler, which is a free tool um, which can connect to Power BI Desktop and Power BI Service. If I stop this and go to my trace definition and let's choose the query begin event, query end, and let's get the direct query begin and end events. Which are, there we go. Click run. And if I do this and refresh here, I can see the T SQL generated, but this will always be the T SQL, regardless of whether you're using a cartridge based connector, which means that it's the actual SQL, or an M based connector, which means it's the T SQL before it gets converted into the other data source. But if you're using SQL Server, this will work. So you can see the SQL generated here. If you've got log analytics enabled on your uh, workspace, I highly recommend that. It's worth the extra cost. You get the same information captured uh, in log analytics, and you just go back and query that whenever you want. So tons and tons of different ways of looking at the SQL that gets generated. Um. Moving on. We've all everything I've talked about so far has been around Power BI generating the SQL for you. Sometimes, though, you want to have control or more control over the SQL gets generated. You can never have complete control over the SQL. Power BI is always going to be generating some SQL for you. But sometimes you want to do some clever stuff. Sometimes you want to be a little bit flexible. And this is where a feature called dynamic M parameters come in. Dynamic M parameters allow you to use a SQL query or something in your Power Query Editor window, <coughs> and then set up a parameter in the Power Query Editor window. And you can use that in your direct query query. Then you can bind that M parameter from the Power Query Editor window to a slicer or a filter in your report, which then means that you can take a value from your report, pass it directly back to the M parameter, and then pass it directly in to, for example, a SQL query. Sounds very flexible, uh, apart from the fact it's not very easy to pass any value you want into a dynamic M parameter, but it is possible if you hack around with some things. So let's see an example of this in my direct query data set. So if we go to the Power Query Editor window here, I've got a query here. Uh, hopefully you can see this, but it's a query that gets first names and last names from a customer dimension table. And then the important bit is that I'm selecting first name and last name where first name like and then percentage sign a search term percentage sign. So we're going to do a really simple like search. This is something you just can't do out of the box in direct query mode unless you're using dynamic M parameters. Now here, We've got our first names and our last names. And then here I've got my search term, which is AN. So I'm looking for any first night first names in this case that start with AN. And therefore I've got Janet and Shannon and Ian and Ethan and Bethany and Diana and all of that. So my query's working. But at the moment, that's only linked to this parameter here. If I go to my report here, what I've got is in the filter pane, I've got, well, actually, before I do that, let me show you something else. What I've also got here is a table called term. This table has one column and no rows in it. It's a way to trick Power BI into thinking that I've got a table to filter on. Usually with dynamic M parameters, you want to have a slicer or something, but that's a little bit boring. What I've got here is a table with one column called term and no rows in it. That column is a text column. 
And then if I take click on this term column here and go to advanced. You can see that I have bound it to the M parameter called search term that I defined in the Power Query editor. Right, having done that, I can drag that term property into the filter pane, use advanced filtering, and then say filter where that term property is OO. That then passes the string OO into my M parameter, which then gets passed into the where clause of my query. And that means that I've now got everybody whose first name is Brooke. But if I was to go and change this to E, for example, and then I need to click apply filter afterwards, it's going to go away and run a SQL query. And now I've got Amy, Ashley, Colleen, Desiree, Kathleen, Kaylee, and all of that. So I've managed to, with a little bit of tricking of Power BI, take a value that I typed in my report, pass it through to a, the where clause of a SQL query, and get the result back. Dynamic M parameters are often the key to being able to do a lot of the more complex things in direct query mode that you need to do. Moving on, another really, really important performance optimization is using composite models and aggregations. This is cheating a little bit because with composite models and aggregations, what you're typically doing is using import mode for some tables inside your data sets. Remember, import mode is faster than direct query mode. In those situations where perhaps you've got a really, really large fact table that can't be loaded into memory, well, that's your fact table. What about your dimension tables? Uh, maybe you could create an aggregation and um, use that inside your data set, which can be an import mode, which means that more of your queries can be run in import mode, which means they're faster, which means they're not using up connections, which means they're not using up resources on your back end, which means that overall performance is faster. So the key in a lot of cases to getting best, best performance out of direct query mode is to use import mode where you don't need direct query mode on different tables in your data set. So let's have a look at this. I have a separate data set for this particular demo. It's basically the same thing with a few changes. So there's my internet sales fact table, and there's my date and my product dimension tables. First thing to point out here, you will notice the kind of dotted lines on the top of the date and the product dimension tables. This means they are not in direct query mode. They're not in import mode either. They're in something called dual mode. Dual mode means that the dimension tables are in both direct query mode and import mode. You're still importing the data, but Power BI can make a call about whether it needs to use the direct query mode version or the import mode version. And what this basically means is that with dimension tables, there are going to be lots and lots of queries that go for slices and things like that. That means the dimension table doesn't need to be joined to anything else. So you just use import mode for that. For other queries where you're getting data from a fact table, well, you probably do want to join the dimension table to the fact table in the SQL. In that case, it makes sense to have the dimension table in direct query mode. So we always recommend that you use dual mode as the storage mode for your dimension tables. Yes, you're importing the data, but you know, even if your the data in your fact table is changing, pretty much always the data in your dimension table doesn't change that often. So we're using dual mode there. I've still got direct query mode for my fax table. But what I've got here as well is I've got another table here, which is based on the internet sales data. It's in import mode. And basically, it aggregates the two measures up to date level. So my fact table's dimensionality is date and product. So each row is the sales for an individual date and for an individual product. This aggregation table, which I'm able to use in import mode, is basically the same data aggregated up to the date level. Now, I've built a relationship between my date dimension table here 
And then what I can do is go to manage aggregations, or not manage relationships, manage aggregations. And then I've specified that this aggregation table um, contains data that has the order date key in it, and it is the sum of the sales amount column for internet sales or the sum of the tax amount column from internet sales. So I'm telling Power BI what is actually aggregated into this table. And then Power BI is clever enough to know whether to use this aggregation table or not when a query is run. So let's look at this report. Let me close this old profile of trace and close this. And again, I'm going to open up profiler connected to this. And again, I need to choose some specific events. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the query begin and end event, the events that are fired when a query begins and ends. And under query processing, I'm going to go and select two events, aggregate table rewrite info and query, which tell me whether this aggregation table is being used or not. And then I'm going to use the direct query begin and end events, the ones we saw a little bit earlier. These are the ones that are fired when SQL queries are being generated. Because we're in direct query mode. And then I'm going to use the Vertipack SE. Query begin and end events. These are the queries. This is these are the events that are fired when I'm querying data from the Vertipack engine, the in memory import mode data set data set engine. So I'm going to click run here. And. Let's have a look at my report. So my report at the moment looks at sales by year as a color slicer, but nothing is selected. Let's. Turn on performance analyzer, start recording, and let's just refresh this visual. So this only gets the sales by year. We look in profiler. What do we see? We see the events associated with the in-memory engine. So even though I built my report and pointed those that sales and tax amount column to the fact table, which is in direct query mode, because I defined an aggregation table on top of that, and it's an import mode, Power BI said, ah, well, this is just getting years and aggregating the data. I can get that from the import mode aggregation table, which is going to be a lot faster. And if we have a look at this aggregate table rewrite query, you can see a bit of information. And it, you know, the important thing is that it found a match. It was able to use an aggregation in this case. Now, if I go to my report and I select something in the color slicer, which means I'm selecting something on the product dimension table, which isn't included in my import aggregation table, which means I've got to go to the Facts table granularity, which is in direct query mode. Still fairly quick, but if we look in profiler, what do we see this time? Direct query begin and end because we had to go to direct query mode to get the data. And if we look at the. Other events, you can see that it, the attempt to rewrite and use an aggregation failed. Aggregations, dual mode, and there's also a feature called hybrid tables, which means that you can mix import mode and uh, direct query mode inside the same table. These just allow you to use import mode for the data that can fit, the data that hasn't changed, for the data that maybe can fit into memory. A few last things to talk about. Um, security. Remember at the beginning, we talked about the need to have security defined in the relational database uh, and not in Power BI. Um, security in direct query mode can be a big problem because if you're using row level security, for example, well, how do you define row level security? You define it with a DAX expression inside your role. And again, remember that DAX expression needs to be converted back to SQL and pushed back to the relational database, which can make things more complicated, which can slow things down. Um, if you apply row level security in the data source, well, yeah, that's problem solved, except that now 
the data source needs to know who's running the query, which then means that Power BI needs to pass the identity of the person running the report back to the relational database, which then means that you have to turn SSO on for your connection, which isn't available for all direct query data sources. For example, we are currently working on this with Google to get it supported for BigQuery. But for most sources like Synapse, SQL Server, Snowflake, Oracle, or whatever, we support SSO. So you can pass the identity over, but you do need to remember to check the box in the Power BI service to do that. Now, that means that you've got connections open that are dedicated to one user, which then means that that means that there are not as many connections to go around and connections might need to be swapped in and out. And that can also cause some performance problems as well. Another interesting thing to talk about, DAX calculations. We love DAX, don't we? We love DAX. Um, and we can do some really amazing things in DAX. We can do all of those complication, complicated calculations that everybody wants us to do. But we also know that even in import mode, the more complicated our DAX gets, the slower our reports get. And this is true 100 times more in direct query mode. Because instead of having to take that complex DAX calculation and then get the data it needs from the VertiBack engine, guess what? Power BI then needs to take that complex DAX query and say, well, what SQL queries do I need to generate to get the data that I need for doing the calculation? And in some cases, some or all of those calculations can be pushed back to SQL, but sometimes they can't be. You know, there's tons of stuff you can do in DAX that you would absolutely never be able to do in SQL. So what happens then? Well, it's complicated. And, you know, you know, all those tricks that Marco and Alberto talk about for optimizing your DAX calculations, um, those tricks don't usually apply to direct query mode. And usually there are other tricks which nobody's really blogged about. So it's a matter of trial and error to rewrite your DAX calculations to get the best possible performance. But generally what you're looking at is trying to reduce the number of SQL queries, trying to, when this magic prop property finally gets properly released, uh, I'll increase the amount of parallelism for your SQL queries. Uh, make sure that the number of SQL queries can be that can be fused as possible is is happening and then also to make sure the SQL that gets generated is as fast as possible. So it is super, super, super complicated. Um, I've got five more minutes, so let me show you a few simple examples of how complicated it is. These are not best practices. These are just examples of how complicated things can be. Right. Let's stop that and close that and let's go back to my main data set. All right, here's a report and I've got a measure. Now remember we've got a product dimension and a date dimension. This measure says give me the sum of sales amount either for rows in my fact table where the date was in the year 2011 or the product was road red something or other, I can't remember what. And this is the DAX that I've written. Uh, hopefully you can see that, I couldn't really zoom in anymore. But what you've got here are two variables, one which uses calculate to get the total sales amount where the color is red, and another which uses calculate to get the total sales amount where the product name is road red 15044. And then I've just summed up the result. Actually, this is technically might return some wrong results in some cases, but I'm just demonstrating. But I've got two calculate statements here. And guess what? If we go to performance analyzer and clear this and refresh and copy the query and just stick it into good old notepad, we've got our DAX query and then we have one SQL query which gets the rows where the product name is road red 44. And then we've got another SQL query, which gets the rows where the product color is red. 
two SQL queries, which at the moment are going to be run one after the other, and you know it's not good. What we can do though, for example, is if we rewrite the calculation and let's get rid of that and put that into here. I'm just doing a single calculate, get the total sales amount using filter, using the whole table in the first parameter of filter, which is usually a big no-no in import mode, but actually doesn't matter in direct query mode in most cases. And then I'm saying here, give me the rows where the product color is red or the product name is road 150 red 44. And as it turns out, if we have a look at this, I assume that's the right query. I've just got a single SQL query now where the color is red and the product name is road red 44. So I'm not saying this is the best practice. What I'm saying is that now your performance tuning has to work differently because all of the best practices that work for the Vertipack engine may not work for your particular connector for your particular data source because they all work differently. You just need to experiment and look at the SQL query that gets generated, trying to optimize, get the most optimal SQL, and then try and get the minimum number of um, SQL queries. And then once you've done that, get the most parallelism possible. And then just to finish off, let's talk about report design quickly. Report design is the final stage for you for tuning your direct query data set. In a lot of cases, the things that work for import mode for improving performance work for direct query mode, but again, they're a thousand times more important. So reduce the number of visuals on the page. Do not have hundreds and hundreds of visuals because hundreds and hundreds of visuals be hundreds of DAX queries, which means hundreds of SQL queries, which might not have enough connections, which might be all inefficient and yeah, it's all bad. So reduce the number of visuals. That does not necessarily mean reduce the amount of stuff on a page because there are all kinds of clever tricks you can play where, for example, instead of having four separate charts that have got different filters on. You can have one chart, use small multiples, and that will very often generate a single query rather than four separate queries. You know, instead of having 10 uh, card visuals, there are some custom visuals that allow you to have what look like 10 separate cards, but are actually one visual, and that's one query. Um, limit the amount of data displayed in the visual. Don't ever have scroll bars. Um, this is something I'm going to probably blog about next week, but in a lot of cases, people just stick loads and loads of fields in a visual, don't mind the scroll bars, and then it just goes down and down. The DAX might have a top 501 limit on it, but that pretty much always doesn't get pushed back for the SQL. So you can end up with some gigantic queries. And then last of all, and this is something where we've done a lot of work recently, check out the new optimize tab in the ribbon. Uh, the optimized tab has performance analyzer on it, which is great. It's got a lot of other good stuff. Uh, we've got these optimization presets. And basically these are properties that were all av always available in the options pane, but very hard to find. But what you can do here is optimize to reduce the number of queries which is particularly important in direct query mode. This basically turns off things like visual interaction. You know, when you click on one visual, does it cross filter the others? If it does, well, guess what? Lots more queries generated. So choose query reduction. Um, something that I think is massively useful, even for import mode, is this uh, apply all slices button. Why is this so important? Well, here's my report. Here's my two slices. They're both set to all. I want to select a year and a color. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to select a year, 2011. What just happened? The main visual got updated. A SQL query got generated, but I didn't want to see just the year. I wanted to see a color as well. So now I've got two SQL queries to populate that visual, and I only ever wanted to select year and color. If I 
have an apply all slices button, I can change my slicer here and change my slicer here. And look, those changes have not yet been applied and won't be applied until I click the button. What's just happened? I've avoided a whole bunch of SQL queries being generated, which I didn't even want to get run in the first place, which again means less load against your data source, which means less expense, which means less other thing, things competing for resources when your real queries are running. So use that. And then as a developer, you've got these pause visuals and refresh visuals buttons, which again are really useful for import mode, which when you press pause, well, you know, you can change stuff but it doesn't update, which means that then you can go and change your measures, you know, change the fields used, and you don't get loads and loads of queries being run in the background. So use this, this is great. I'm already out of time, but I'm just gonna say one last thing. You've done everything you can as a Power BI person. You've followed all the best practices. The last thing you do when you've got everything working well, you need to find a friendly DBA because Power BI is still generating SQL queries, and those SQL queries can be tuned on the back end. Now, if you can do that yourself, great. I can't, I'm a Power BI person. So having done all of these different things, go and find somebody who can tune the back end, ask them to tune the SQL queries. Maybe if they can't do it, they will say, well, Chris, can you get this Power BI to generate queries that look like this, which might mean you have to start all over again with your modeling and you know, all of the other design. Generally speaking, though, it should be possible in this day and age, even on very large result sets, assuming you've got a company credit card that hasn't been maxed out, to get SQL queries that run in one or two seconds. A lot of the time in direct query mode, people show me Power BI reports that take 20, 30, 40 seconds because the SQL queries are massively slow and haven't been optimized. That's rubbish. Nobody wants to look at a report that's that slow. Tune it. All right. Oh, OK, I do have one more slide. But after you've done all that, test, test, test. The number of people who do not test before they go into production and, you know, it worked OK on my machine. But guess what? When all the 2000 users got let loose on it, it all fell down in the heap. Test it, for goodness sake. Um, there is a load testing tool that we have for the CAT team that allows you to simulate realistic loads against your report. This is, again, Important for import mode, it is a hundred times more important for direct query mode. But once you've done all that, yeah, you should be able to get direct query mode working nicely. But remember what I said, it's so much easier with import mode. All right, thank you. Time for a break. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. <laughs>